Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. So I'd like first to thank the um, organizers of this Congress for letting me talk about something that I think is very important, not just for clinician-patient relationships, but for our everyday relationships as well. Because I think difficult conversations are not only seen in the clinic, but in our everyday interactions with our friends, family, and colleagues also. But for the purpose of this talk, I will be going through a case and going through, uh, looking at it at the lens, from the lens of a clinician. Um, and we'll go through the case of a patient, which will take us through three um, common but difficult conversations that we can face in the clinics. So um, before I start with the case, I do want to uh, show this because um, as we all know, these are difficult conversations, so we have to be brave enough to start them. As clinicians, um, we have to remember that it may be difficult for us, but it's doubly difficult for the patients who have cancers to start this, these conversations and to hear them. So we have to be the ones to initiate the conversations, especially if you think they matter to the prognosis and the treatment of the patient. So to start, we have Mrs. T, a 71-year-old lady who has been diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer. She underwent palliative chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and is now on treatment holiday, so on um, rest from treatment due to intolerable side effects, specifically fatigue. Um, her latest scans show that she had disease progression. Some things to know about our patient is that she stays with her husband at home, and she has two adult children, a son who lives a few minutes away, and a daughter who works and lives in another country. So what's the serious news here? We know that she has disease progression, it's, so it's something that we have to let her know. Um, I'll go through a few strategies on how to disclose serious news, um, but I want to um, give a disclaimer that you will see a lot of acronyms in this talk, but I, uh, the goal is not to have everyone memorize the acronyms and when you're talking to patient to go through the different letters. No? So the goal is to remind you that there is a process, there are frameworks to follow, but there are important um, points in e each of these strategies to remember, not necessarily to go through them one by one, but to remember that there are important points that you can um, use. So the first tool is the guide tool. So as uh, it's an acronym, but it's basically a guide to help us um, set the stage for disclosing serious news. So it stands for getting ready, understanding what the patient knows, informing of the patient of the news that you want to tell them, demonstrating empathy, and then equipping or preparing them for the next step. We'll go through them one by one. So what do you mean by getting ready? Not just you, you have to uh, get the information ready, make sure that you have the right information, make sure that you have the right people in the room, not just the patient, the patients who matter, uh, the family, the friends, or the people who matter to the patient. And of course, make sure that you have privacy when you're having this talk. Understand what the patient knows. So, baka naman, naintindihan na pala niya. Maybe she already knows or he already knows what's happening. So you can ask them, what thoughts have you had since the biopsy, the tests, or what have you taken away from the other doctors? What do you understand? Or what do you think your test shows? Ano sa tingin mo ang lumabas sa CT scan, sa MRI, sa PET scan? And then inform them. This is the meat of this, uh, of this um, strategy. How do you inform them of the serious news? So use a headline. So how do you use a headline? You summarize the news in one sentence, a simple sentence not using any jargon. In this example, your scans show that the cancer has gotten worse. Or maybe you can say, your cancer has not responded to the chemotherapy. The biopsy shows you have a new cancer. So use a one sentence headline and then pause. So you pause, you don't stop. You don't stop with just the headline. You pause to give them time to digest the information and then you give details. So what's important here? Aside from using a headline, you avoid jargon. So the end goal is not for us to tell what we want to tell them. It's for the patient to come home understanding what has happened, what you wanted to tell them. 
So if you, sometimes it's easy to just go back to using jargon, to uh, fall back on using medical language, because that's easier. Even I myself find uh, sometimes um, when I'm having a difficult time talking to the patient, I fall back on using medical jargon, and then at the end of the day, I'm happy na, ah, nasabi ko lahat ng kailangan ko sabihin. But it doesn't, um, it doesn't give the patient what they need. So it, it doesn't help them understand what's happening. And then demonstrating empathy. So you do this by responding to the emotions that they're having. Um, I'll go through a little bit more about how to respond to emotions in a few slides. So it's very normal for the patient's first response to be emotional. So even uh, in everyday settings, so we tend to be emotional in, uh, when we get serious news or bad news. So you acknowledge the emotions and try to find out what are the uh, reasons behind those emotions. And then equip or prepare for the next steps. So it doesn't stop with you telling them about the bad news. So you move forward and you ask them, can I explain more or can we talk about what we can do next? Or can we talk about what this means in terms of uh, treatment or next steps? So don't dismiss their concerns. Um, sometimes it's easy to say, it's okay, everything will be okay, everything will be all right. So try not to fall into that trap because you can't really assure them that everything will be okay. Sometimes things don't turn out the way we hope to, and that's okay too. So again, the guide tools, basically getting ready the information and the people and the location ready, understanding what they know, informing them, again, using a headline and avoiding medical jargon, demonstrating empathy or responding to their emotions, and then equipping or preparing for the next step. Here's another um, strategy that can be um, easier to remember, the ask, tell, ask strategy, which is basically the same. But after preparing the scenario, you ask them what they understand already, you tell them what the results are, and then ask them, does that make sense? Do you have any questions? So explore what they want to um, uh, understand better about your news. And then my personal favorite, the, wor the wish, worry, wonder strategy. And this is especially helpful in situations um, that's related to what Dr. Trinidad talked about. You know, so uh, alternative medicine, or if you have patients or family members who have um, like false hopes or falsely optimistic outlooks uh, in terms of what's happening with regards to their cancer. So you can start with something like, I wish I could say that the chemo always works. Sana nga yung mga herbal medications, meron talaga tayong gumagana para sa cancer. Sana merong alternative or uh, additional therapies that are available for treatment. But I worry that your cancer has not responded the way we hoped it would. And then I wonder if you'd be open to discussing the next steps or other options. So why is this useful? Because it starts with you aligning with the hopes of the patient. You show them that you care. And at the end of the day, that's why we're doing what we're, why, that's why we do what we're doing, right? Because we care about the patient. So this shows them, this tells them that you really are there with them, hoping for the same things. But sometimes the reality is, we, things don't turn out the way we hope for them to. So after that, I, I, do, I told you I wanted to talk a little bit about how to respond to emotions. So this acronym is very helpful, the nurse statements, because I always remember our nurses, our friendly nurses, are very good at responding to emotional patients. And it's actually, um, I think I saw a meme the other day about a doctor facing uh, an emotional patient and just calling the nurse basically to respond to the patient. So what does a uh, nurse stand for? It stands for naming the emotion, understanding the meaning behind the emotions, respecting, supporting, and then exploring. So what are some examples for these strategies? Naming, so if you see a patient getting uh, frustrated or angry, 
you can just state what you're seeing. It seems like you're getting frustrated. It seems like you're sad about this. I can see that this makes you uncomfortable. So an example of this is like I had a patient who was very um, stoic. So we talked about disease progression. And then the patient was just saying, okay doc, sige po, ano pong gagawin natin? And then beside him, his wife was starting to tear up and then humihikbi hikbi na. And then I could have just left it at that. I could have just, okay naman si patient eh, so hindi ko kailangan ng messy discussion with his wife. But it's important to explore what's happening because sometimes um, exploring that emotion that's happening in front of you is what opens up the conversation um, to what's important to the patient. So I told the wife, Mrs. Ganyan, um, mukhang uh, nalulungkot ka sa narinig po. So, ang sagot ni Mrs. Kasi po dok, si husband ko, ganyan. And then that started the conversation with the husband who really wasn't talking much. So he says, kasi po, I, want, I wanted to see my daughter grow up and graduate. So that opened the conversation to a deeper exploration of their goals of care, which we'll talk a little bit about later. The next uh, strategy is understanding. So basically telling them that this really helps me understand what you're thinking or what's important to you. So it's acknowledging what, uh, why they're having those emotional responses. Next is respecting. So you can sometimes see patients who are um, getting frustrated already or getting really sad why their disease has progressed. And you try to respect uh, what's happening. So you tell them, I can see that you've been trying to follow our instructions. I appreciate that you did all that uh, we talked about, um, but this is, uh, this is what happened. And then supporting. Something as simple as telling them, I hear you. Naririnig ko po ang sinasabi ninyo. No? It, it shows them that, again, you're there with them. The reality cannot be changed, but you're there with them to help them through what they're going through. And then lastly, I think this is the most important one, is exploring. So when they have an emotional reaction, it's important to try to explore, because there's usually a reason behind those emotions. So you can tell them, can you say more about what you mean when you say that you're frustrated or it seems like you're sad can you tell me more about why or something as simple as tell me more or sige nga ano pa po ang gusto niyong sabihin so nurse statements naming understanding respecting supporting and exploring so you don't have to use them all at the same time one after the other so these are really just some strategies that you can use in response to emotional responses to pick up from patients. So back to Mrs. T. She had disease progression, we talked about it, um, and she's now back, she's processed it, na, na tanggap na niya that her disease has progressed. So she's now back with her husband to talk about what the next steps are. So this brings us to talking about goals of care and advanced directives. So. I, I just want to say at this point that not all patient interactions will go in this direction. There are a lot of um, positive outcomes, so not everyone will go through what we're gonna see in this case. So the REMAP framework, this framework was actually created to help medical oncologists have goals of care discussions with patients. So, para lang din siyang guide uh, tool, it's really setting up the, the um, location, the place, and then talking to um, the patient about what's happening. So, it, it stands for reframing, expecting emotions, mapping the future, aligning with values, and planning. So, what does that mean? You start by reminding them where we are now. So, reframe the situation. Sometimes the patient will come in, okay, doc. So... Okay pa ako. No, so remind them where we are now. So we are in a different place right now. Is it okay if we talk about next steps? And then again, expect emotions. It's very, very normal to have emotional responses to difficult news. So always expect them. And then you can use the nurse statements. Map the future. So 
given what we know about your illness, now alam na natin na uh, lumala yung cancer mo. Can you tell me more about what's important to you? So, as you think about the future, ano ang pinaka-worried ka? Ano ang bagay na importante para sa'yo? And then, recognize what's important to them by aligning with their values. So, verbalizing that you're with them is very powerful. Telling them that I hear you. So, ang intindi ko, ang importante sa'yo ay makita ang anak mong graduate. I hear you. I know that's important. And then plan. So now that I have a bet better understanding, let's talk about options. So ngayong naintindihan ko na yan ang gusto mo, siguro pag-usapan natin how we can achieve that. Or sometimes if they have unrealistic um, expectations, you can tell them, even if I'm not sure if we can get there, maybe we can talk about what we can do to make that more possible. So this basically, uh, the goals of care conversations is the first part of advanced care planning, the thinking part. So that's where you think about what, what their thought, values are, wishes, beliefs, and then sharing, not just with the healthcare workers, but with their family members. And then I just wanted to add this to um, make sure that you write or record those wishes. So think about legal documents, special power of attorneys, living wills, because these goals of care, the advanced care planning, can change, and they usually do change. And if it comes to a point that the patient is not able to um, remind the family of what they've uh, decided on, it's important to have a written document to, to show the family that, remember, we talked about this, um, remember, this is what's important to them, so that can help them make decisions in the future as well. So for Mrs. T, she's still independent and active, and when we talked about it, her goals of care were to maintain a good quality of life, hopefully with minimal symptoms. She wants to stay at home as much as possible instead of the hospital, but she's still willing to try more treatment, um, however, preferably as an outpatient. So what happened later, she was enrolled in a clinical trial, but unfortunately had to drop off because of side effects. It's been three months since her last treatment, and when we had another discussion about her goals of care, she wanted to stay home as much as possible. She didn't want to be in a hospital. She didn't want artificial life support, and she didn't want resuscitation. She identified her husband as her decision maker, and that's a whole nother talk um, about uh, identifying a decision maker. But in this case, that really helps because we know who to talk to if she's not able to voice her wishes. So now she's unfortunately bedridden, dependent for all ADL, so activities of daily living. She's sleeping most of the time and has minimal oral intake. So this uh, brings us to the third and probably a little bit more difficult conversation to have, which is talking about prognosis and dying with the patient or their families. So this tool, again, it's an acronym not for everyone to memorize and to follow to the dot, but to show you how to go about it. It's just basically an example of how to go about it. It stands for asking what the patient or the family knows and what they want to know. Discover what kind of information would be useful for them. Anticipate ambivalence, which is the most important part of talking about prognosis, because not everyone will be ready to talk about prognosis. Provide the information in the form that they want, in the form that they feel will be helpful for them and then track emotions or respond to emotions again. So asking them what they know, how, what they want to know, you can ask them simply by saying, how much have you been thinking about the future? Or ano yung naiintindihan mo sa base sa pag-uusap ninyo ng mga ibang doktor nyo? Or given sa mga nangyayari ngayon, ano yung mga iniisip nyo? And then discover what kind of information they want, what kind of information will be helpful for them. So what do we mean by that? Sometimes, some patients would want specific statistics. Gusto nila, Doc, what are my chances to live in five years, in three years, ganyan? 
others, ano ba, good, bad chan. So ask them. And this is a good example. For some people, it's just a number. It's numbers or statistics, and that's what they want to know. For others, really, it's about getting to a certain date, if that's possible or not. What do you think will be helpful to you? Um, one thing to remember, if you don't have statistics, don't ask them if they want to hear statistics. Kasi pag sinabi nilang, I want numbers, doctora, and you don't have numbers to give them, parang wala nang point yung conversation ninyo. So this applies if you have the numbers to back it up. So anticipating ambivalence. Again, not everyone will be ready to talk about it. So if they're saying, na, mm, maybe I don't want to talk about it now, but you feel like it's important for them to hear, you can explore it a little bit. You can tell them, if you're not sure, maybe you could tell me how you see the pros and cons are of discussing this. Or if hindi pa kayo ready, pwede naman natin pag-usapan next time. Or if you want, let me know, bakit hindi kayo nagdadalawang isip ngayon? Hindi naman kailangan pag-usapan agad ngayon. But in some cases, like where they're clinically deteriorating, and you think it's important for them to hear the prognosis or the changing prognosis, you can say, from what I know of you, sa pagkakakilala ko po sa inyo, I think importante yung mapag-usapan natin to. Kasi mag mag pwedeng magbago yung mga decision ninyo. No? Or I think important yung mapag-usapan to kasi para hindi mahirapan yung pamilya niyo, asawa ninyo, mag-make ng decisions para sa inyo. Then provide the information if they ask for it, if they want, in the way that they want it. So these are just some examples. Either give them statistics. So worst case scenario is so and so. The best case is kanyan. If I have 100 people with a similar situation, by three months, 50% would have died, and then 50% would still be alive. Or without statistics, you can tell them, from my understanding and your situ of your situation, I think there's either a good chance that you'll be alive by your daughter's graduation, or really it's unlikely that you'll reach that goal, or it's 50-50, it's really undetermined at this point. And then always discuss uncertainty. Even if you're talking about statistics based on studies, there's never, you can never ascertain that th this is what's gonna happen to them. So always tell them these are averages, these are based on experience with other patients. So it, your situation can be different. If they're acutely deteriorating, it may be helpful to talk to them in terms of time intervals. So, you may have hours to day le days left. Your family member may have days to weeks or weeks to several months. Or if it's really uncertain, I can't really say how much time we have. It's difficult to say at this point. And then again, track emotion, respond to emotions. It's so normal to have an emotional response when having these conversations. So don't be surprised if they become emotional. So what happened with, with Mrs. T? She's now unfortunately imminently dying and you've talked to her family that she, she may have hours to days left. Her husband and her son is at her bedside at home where she wanted to stay, but her daughter is unable to travel back to be with her. But she's in constant communication with them through video calls and uh, phone calls. So what can we do in this situation? So this is basically just something that we can uh, help their families with. You know that the patient is dying and it's difficult. If anyone here has had a family member go through this, you know that it's difficult to talk to them in, this, in these situations. So you as the clinician can help them. So you do that by leading the way forward, offering the things that are important to most people, validating what they want to say, and then again, expecting emotional responses. So how do you lead the way? If you're new to the team, make sure that you introduce yourself and why you're uh, doing what you're doing. If you know them already, tell them, I know that this is a tough situation and I'm here to walk you through it if you'd like. So again, that's with inv an invitation from them because if they don't want it, don't push it. Offer the things that matter most to most people. 
So sometimes they, uh, I've had patients who tell me, I don't know what to say, doctora. Ano bang sasabihin ko? Di ko nga alam kung naririnig niya ako eh. So you can tell them, some things that you can say include, please forgive me or I forgive you. That's forgiveness. Thank you to show gratitude. I love you or goodbye. And then tell them, use whatever feels uh, important to you and then you can expound or not. And then validate what they want to say. Diba? Sabi ko, sometimes they say, naririnig ba nila, nila talaga ako? And really, we, we can't really know because no one's ever come back from imminently dying to tell us if they actually heard us. But these conversations during this time is not really for the patient but for the family members at bedside. So tell them, I think that's a beautiful thing to say. And honestly, I myself believe that they can hear them because I've seen patients who have like a more peaceful passing if they have family, bed, family at the bedside who talk to them. So I tell my patients, I think they can hear you. And even if they don't, there's nothing wrong with telling them that you love them, telling them goodbye. And then another thing that you can say, if it was my daughter or my mother say, saying that to me, I would value it so much. And then expect emotion. So don't leave the room and tell them, okay, bye, thank you. Uh, talk to them a little bit and say, can you, can you stay for a minute? I want to check on how you're doing. So it's at this point, it's not just about the dying patient. It's also just as important to see to their family members. So back with Mrs. T. She passed away a day later, very peacefully at home with her husband and son at bedside and her daughter on the phone. So what are some of the key takeaways from everything that I've talked about? I think number one is to expect emotional responses. Again, it's very normal to have emotional responses when having difficult conversations, so always expect them so that you're not surprised. You can practice your nurse statements, naming, understanding, respecting, supporting, and exploring so that you can find out what the reasons are behind those responses. And then we owe it to our patients to initiate these conversations, but not everyone will be ready. As I said in the prognosis part, expect ambivalence. And that's okay too. Remember the bottom line, we're here to work with the patient and their families to achieve their goals. So as Dr. Dion so eloquently put it earlier, we want to make decisions with patients, not for them. Thank you.